So um, my name is Sonja Eismann. I am one of the project coordinators of um, this uh, wonderful project. I'm also one of the editors of the final book that you can see here in its English version. There's also a German version. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project first and Urvashi Butalia, the um, publisher of Zuban Books. This wonderful version will also tell you a little bit about her involvement in the project. And then we'll have three project presentations by the six artists gathered on the screen here. And then there will be a short discussion and also an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So let me start with showing you some slides of the first presentation. <laughs> okay, so that was too fast. Okay, so this was um, the um, uh, design that we came up for, uh, with before um, the project even started or in the very beginning of the project is, is by an Indonesian artist, Mariska Surikarna. And uh, in the year 2020, uh, we launched an open call for uh, indigenous, uh, for comics on indigenous feminisms from the global south. And that was um, the flyer for the project. And uh, actually the project um, had started before and we didn't even know it then, but one of the, um, yeah, one of the things that it came out of was a, a trip to Berlin also of a group of um, Southeast Asian feminist activists and Australian New Zealand feminist activists. And you can see us uh, on the uh, terrace of the um, FFBEZ, it's a feminist archive in Berlin. And um, this led to a lot of questions about feminist movements being archived and what gets written about, what gets kept, what uh, is taught maybe in schools or most likely not. And then we had a follow-up meeting in um, the Goethe Institute of Jakarta in 2019, half a year later, and we gathered ideas to make this uh, wonderful meeting and exchange of activists more sustainable. And uh, I don't know if you can see it from your seats, but in this egg-shaped bubble, the, the white one uh, at the top, no, the, the second from the top, um, there's actually some writing about comic, a comic book anthology on specific feminist issues. There was one of many ideas and um, there were lots of other wonderful ideas, but as you all know, financial resources are scarce. So in the end, we were really happy to get funding for this one project. Uh, there was a Goethe Institute excellent grant and we could start uh, with our open call for um, feminist uh, comics or comics on feminist uh, comics on feminist indigenous movements. So um, we had a, a, a very uh, intricate application process. We received the stunning number of two and uh, 218 applications from 325 applicants in 42 countries. And of course, we um, couldn't publish all of these stories, although we would have liked to because they were wonderful ideas. But we um, got together a jury to find out which um, stories were most suitable for our project. Uh, part of the jury was Urvashi Butalia, who's here on stage uh, with us, who's the, uh, the publisher and founder of uh, Zuban Books. Awa Mendes, who is a trans-feminist indigenous artist from Brazil, who does art, illustrations, graffiti, and Johann Ulrich, who is the head of Avant Verlag, an alternative comic book publisher here from Berlin, and us uh, three from the Goethe Institute, Ingo Schöning from the Goethe Institute Jakarta, Maya from Jakarta, and myself as a um, yeah, freelance worker. So in the end, um, we, uh, we had planned to publish um, six, uh, 10 stories in print, but there were so many wonderful stories that we uh, tried to use part of the, uh, we decided to use part of the budget um, to also publish online only stories. So in the end, we had uh, 16 stories that we selected. And what were our criteria for these um, stories? Of course, the artistic quality and what people had done before. We weren't going for like the super famous comic book pros who had like the best track record, but people who had like an 
original or even innovative approach to comics. And uh, we didn't care if they'd only done illustrations before or wonderful comic books. We were looking for this yeah, original approach. And of course, their motivation to be part of this um, very specific pro project. Also, the relevance of the movement and the protagonist was important for this project. And we tried to go for a good balance of regions, time periods, and story focus, which was the hardest part because, you I mean, it can't cover all this with only 16 stories. Uh, but we, we tried to have like a good balance. Yeah, in the, in the final selection, we had these 16 stories by 32 participants. Some of them were working in teams of twos or threes. Some of them were working alone. And we had stories and participants from 14 countries. Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, India, Pakistan, and Nepal. And we were really happy to have not only one or two, but three publishers in the end. Zuban Books with an uh, English edition, Yaya Falag uh, with a German edition, and Drawn and Quarterly uh, from North America with another um, English edition for the um, North American market. Yeah, so to give you an, uh, a, a short overview of the, um, the, the, the scope of the project and to see how many different things were covered and how many wonderfully different uh, visual styles there are, I just um, copied all the, um, the um, covers from the website and rushed through them. You can also always um, look them up and read them for free at the Goethe website, but you should also support uh, uh, feminist publishers and buy the books. So yeah, you get like a short impression. Yeah, my time is already up, so I'm rushing through. Yeah, and, and just to add this, there, there are a, a really a wide variety of important topics, but there are five main topics, ecology, education, sexual rights, LGBTQI plus movements, working conditions and the passing on of traditions, mainly matrilinear traditions. So this is us during a Zoom call. Yeah, and there were lots of challenges, but we'll talk about them later. And um, yeah, I show you the um, five, uh, three editions. Hopefully there'll be five in the end. But I'll hand over the mic to Urvashi and uh, I'll be curious to hear from you again what made you interested in this project and what made you decide to publish this book. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you to all of you for contributing this and to Goethe Institute Indonesia, Maya and Ingo for involving us uh, in this. You know, in every now and again in the life of a feminist publisher, a project or an idea for a book comes along and you recognize with the shock of recognition that this is precisely what you want to do and this is everything that you believe in and everything that you want to be involved in. So your idea was one such um, thing that came to us and we count ourselves fortunate that with Goethe Institute Indonesia, we moved from being just me on the jury to being seen as one of the publishers for this book. Uh, what fascinated us about it was the idea of focusing on indigenous women's movements in the global south and of getting as far as possible artists, especially young artists, graphic artists to write and so the, the wealth of stories in it was uh, really important for us. And in the process, I think there were a lot of learnings and there were a lot of discoveries. For example, uh, you know, we all talk about global feminism, but the contact is often limited to people we know. With these stories <clears throat> at our doorstep arrived multiple ways of using language. So a word that in one context might have seemed insulting was in another context completely normal. And we had a lot of discussions about uh, language uh, and how it operates in different ways. Uh, discovery was the discovery of a feminist press in the Philippines, which we did not know about, Gantala Press. Is that how you say it? Um, and that was a new partnership that is now 
being created, so that uh, too. And the creativity of artists and the different styles and methods you've seen in the covers and so on, that um, these there are very different ways of addressing uh, similar kinds of issues. And what I mentioned also yesterday, the very honest look, because it's a feminist examination of history, of our own histories. So there isn't a papering over or a glossing over of differences and so on, but looking back at history from the point of view of learning from it. And I think that was also lovely. And then the methods of working for us were so important. We had many discussions uh, in which we found ways of working together, um, learning each other's priorities and uh, to us, that's a very valuable feminist enterprise because uh, being a feminist publisher is not only about the content of what you publish, but the ways in which you actually bring that content to the world and the relationships you build with not only the writers, but everybody else that is involved in that uh, enterprise. So in my office, there was constant excitement about this and constant frustration at having to work with files that were transmitted over the internet and that got corrupted along the way and that had to be changed and we were just having those discussions this morning about how did this line appear on top and, and so on and so forth. And finally, I want to say that we also, to some extent, because feminism shamelessly shares ideas and steals ideas, making them their own, so we have shamelessly decided to steal this idea and uh, to now get involved in an enterprise of the next couple of years, also supported by the Goethe Institute in India, to map a graphic history of 100 years of the women's movement in India. And I have already decided to steal the India story from Ritika and Maitri. Uh, so you will hear about it um, in due course. We'll take your permission, but I'm sure that it won't be denied. So in that sense, uh, it's an idea that gives birth to a whole lot of other similar ideas going out into the world. And for all of these reasons, this has been for us a really important project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Urvashi, for sharing these experiences. And thank you for being part of the project. That's really valuable. And yeah. And now we're going to start with the first um, story presentation by um, Maitri Dore and Ritika Subramanian. And yeah, Maitri, I'll just keep the, the biographies really short because the stories speak for themselves. Maitri is an architect and freelance illustrator from Mumbai, Indina, India, and she's currently pursuing a PhD in cultural heritage conservation at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. And Ritika is a journalist and researcher from Mumbai. She's currently pursuing her PhD in gender studies as a Gates Cambridge scholar at the University of Cambridge. And um, their story, maybe can show the audience the wonderful uh, edition you uh, produced, is Raindrop in the Drought, Godavri Dange. And I'll hand and over the, the clicker to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I mean, Maitri and I are incredibly honored, humbled, and just very, very happy to be here today. And uh, our work, which we'll be presenting today, is a book that we've been working on, which is called Dushkarat Pausatsa Theme, also known as Raindrop in the Drought. Um, and we will be featuring and speaking more about our uh, protagonist, phenomenal woman called Godavari Dange. And, um, before we begin and get into the specifics of our project and how we went about doing feminism, um, we will broadly give you an overview of the context in which Godavari Dange has been practicing her feminism um, and you know, um, an overall idea of the region as well. So to begin with, um, women make up more than 50% of the labor force in the agricultural sector in India. Uh, you know, they work in family farms, small plots of land, yet most often, they remain unrecognized as workers, they are underpaid, and unrecognized by their families, by their communities, by the markets, and the state. Um, and set against this context is our protagonist, Godavari Dange, who is a feminist leader and uh, farmer entrepreneur in Marathwada region of India. Just a second. I think it's not moving ahead. 
Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, great, thank you. So Maratwana region, uh, as we can see in the section brown on the map there, is a region which is located in the western state of Maharashtra in India. It is uh, pretty much located, uh, it is, Maharashtra as a state is actually the richest state in the country. And ironically, uh, you know, Maratwada as a region remains a region with one of the lowest socioeconomic and human development indicators even today. Um, and the region is historically drought prone and caste ridden. And as a region over here, it is also known as the land of thirst. It is the epicenter of India's agrarian crisis. And even today, the cases of uh, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, um, farmer suicides, child marriages, school dropout rates are incredibly high and continue to rise. And one of the core reasons is, of course, the drought in terms of it being a historically drought prone region and politics of water is what drives the very village economy there. Um, and uh, our protagonist, uh, Godavari Dange, uh, is, was born in this region, and she was actually born a few years after the 1972 drought, which was one of the worst droughts the region had experienced. And uh, over the, and you know, she was actually, uh, dro she dropped out of school at the age of 13. She was married at the age of 16, and by the time she turned 19, she was a widow with two children. And driven by these very trying personal circumstances, as well as the context in which Marathwada as a region was functioning with high drought, high debt, and recurring disaster. Godavari Dange managed to you know, practice her feminism in a way she actually didn't even call it feminist practice at that point. But what she essentially did was with colleagues and people and other women farmers she met at an organization called Swayam Shikshan Prayog, put together an entire sort of movement in a way which actually began as a way in which she introduced her friend into it and sort of said, you know what? Let's ensure that we match up to and ensure that everyone in the region gets food on their plate. So food security became an important part of her work. In addition to that, you know, to ensure that the drought, which had taken away a lot of their basic access to basic sustainable crops, good health, which as I mentioned earlier, was a very, very important part of it. So one of the things that she did was bring together a few women, which is actually six to seven women at the beginning. And over the years today, that entire you know, practice of sustainable farming, of indigenous farming, of growing food crops, has now turned into an entire movement with over 60,000 women from the region practicing this one acre farming model. We will speak specifically about the one acre farming model towards the end, but this is just to give you a broad context in which Godavari Dange's feminism was based on ensuring that women were recognized as farmers, as workers, they were remunerated, they could be self-sufficient, and in a way, think of climate change as a very rooted, ground-up problem. Maitri will now take us through the process of the comic. Thank you. So uh, why we wanted to share this story was, uh, on one hand, it had never been, it, had, it, was, it hadn't received much attention in the media internationally and nationally. And um, what is truly remarkable about Godavari Dange is her grit of character, because despite her trying personal circumstances, she came out and um, uh, tried to help other women um, overcome their own struggles. And on a more practical level, um, Marathwada is um, close to where we both come from, Mumbai. Uh, so it was um, easy to access and um, also, in terms of the language, uh, we, uh, we could um, do interviews in Marathi. Uh, as well as um, during the pandemic, it became more convenient to visit the place. And uh, we went there between waves. And um, it was overall, um, it was a convenient um, access. Uh, it was it afforded convenient access. And um, we tried to make this process as uh, participatory as possible because um, we are conscious of our own positions as uh, urban bred, um, uh, upper caste women, and um, we wanted to uh, let Godavari Dange uh, tell the story in her voice and in the way that she thought suitable. So um, we uh, went along with her, she showed us whom she thought was important to speak to, she introduced us to the people who were important and who played impo an important role in her life. So we didn't go really with a structured questionnaire or set of um, points that we needed to cover, but we went with the flow and had unstructured uh, conversations with these people. So um, the fieldwork involved uh, a ton of interviews with um, Godavari Dange herself, 
her friends, uh, family, colleagues at Swayam Shikshan Prayog, which is the NGO where she works. And then also a lot of documentation through, photogra uh, through, through photography. So um, just um, documenting the minute details of her house, uh, the, um, for example, the pots and pans, the way things were organized in her uh, home, uh, down to the toothbrush and the toothbrush holder hung on the wall, her handbag. Um, and all of these were really important for us uh, in order to create, uh, to make the story authentic as well as relatable and to keep it as close to her own story as possible. Um, and it was, we tried to make it participatory in that we had this three-way WhatsApp group between the three of us and there was a constant flow of information um, between us so we would share pencil sketches and she would respond with feedback and tell us that no, this was this way or not this way and then um, give us more information where we asked like for example in this WhatsApp chat we asked how was your hair tied when you got married? And then she would respond with this photo with a scribble of how she looked back then. So um, it, was a, it was a very, uh, um, yeah, the process, this is what happened for about two years and it really got, it was an immersive experience for us. Um, and as for how we constructed the story itself, it was entirely from interviews. So we've taken the dialogues um, verbatim where possible from, where, from what she said, as well as from what uh, the people we interviewed said. And so we wanted it to be close to her voice. And um, we also wanted to have a, um, a balance between the visuals and the text in such a way that the, the text didn't overpower the visuals because we thought that uh, the, um, the visual needed to, uh, since the visual, um, it, it would, it would um, over, overcome linguistic barriers and be more accessible. So therefore we had this light touch approach with respect to the text where it would be simple and um, easy to follow and not repetitive. Uh, I mean, that was what we aimed to do. Um, just to show you some images from the project, uh, that's Godavari Dange, um, real and illustrated versions. Uh, these are some of the characters we depicted. Um, this is Anita Kulkarni, who was her mentor and a huge influence during her early years and who kind of initiated her into the tradition of um, sustainable agriculture. Uh, she features in the book and in the movie that we're going to show. Uh, this is... Um, Archana Bhosle, her best friend uh, through childhood and a strong woman in her own right because um, she's the uh, first uh, woman postmaster of Tuljapur district. Um, then we have uh, Nazim Sheikh, who's a colleague at Swayam Shikshan Prayog, who is also a co-pioneer of the One Acre model with Godavari Dange. And um, that's her late husband who uh, passed away uh, in an accident uh, when she was 21. Uh, I'll pass it on to Ritika now, who will speak about the journey of the book post-completion. Um, so yeah, actually the journey of the book has been interesting even post-production. It has come full circle in a way. One of the things is as a project, uh, you know, on the one hand, it has been featured in several national as well as regional publications. And in keeping with the whole participatory approach of our whole project itself, a lot of pieces we co-authored with Godavari Tai, uh, and uh, you know it has been featured quite extensively. So that was one interesting sort of development which happened quite organically. And more interestingly, the book has made its journey back to Marathwada. And uh, you know one of the important things was in this whole process, we didn't want to intervene with the ways in which Godavari Dange wanted to share her book. So which is why we told her that you can take it back to the people you want to you know, share it with. And so which is why one of the more uh, interesting things was that uh, you know, she approached with the organization, the district collectorate in uh, Marathwada and Osmanabad district. And uh, the book was officially launched over there. And a lot of government officials, including the agricultural officers, the education officer, have taken a lot of interest in the book. And nearly 5,000 copies of the Marathi edition of the book were printed and have been distributed in the government-run schools over there. So that was a big, uh, I mean, it was very overwhelming as well for us. And uh, I think all these photos are from WhatsApp. And one image that was really heartwarming for us was the book went back to her mother, the photo that you can see at the very bottom. Uh, that is Vidya Tai. And, uh, you know, she's unlettered, but, uh, you know, she could access the comic book. And, I mean, these images are all coming on our WhatsApp group and continue to overwhelm us every day. Um, and just to end, to take this whole uh, 
process forward and you know sort of democratizing the whole thing and making it accessible we've turned the entire book into an animated film with the support of the Goethe Institute in Berlin and uh, we will be showing you a short excerpt of the film and we hope to actually distribute this film through WhatsApp and other local media so they can go back to more people back in Marathwada itself uh, thank you can we just screen the film please दोन हजार सात साली मराठवाड्यात पुन्हा दुष्काळ पडला शेतीसाठी अगदी कमी पाणी होतं श्रीमंत आणि मोठे शेतकरी नगदी पीक घे जगवण्यासाठी अगदी खोलपर्यंत बोर घ्यायला लागले येत्या वर्षात अनिश्चितता नुकसान आणि भूक यांचा सामना करावा लागणार हे आम्हा महिलांना स्पष्ट दिसत होतं कुलकर्णीताईचं हे शब्द माझ्या कानामध्ये नेहमी घुमत होते अन्नधान्य पिकवण्यासाठी महिला तयार करणं हे माझ्यासाठी खूप कठीण होतं त्यांचे नवरे त्यांना जमिनीतला अर्धा एकर तुकडाही देण्यासाठी तयार नव्हते मला फक्त एकच व्यक्ती माहीत होती ती माझ्यावर पूर्ण विश्वास ठेवल अशी माझी मैत्रीण अर्चना अर्चनाने तिच्या जमिनीत मिश्र पीक घ्यायला सुरुवात केली ज्वारी बाजरी कडधान्ये आणि पालेभाज्या थोड्या पाण्यावरही ती पिकं चांगली तयार व्हायची ही गोष्ट जशी जशी पसरली सगळ्यांना माहिती झाली तशी तशी इतर महिलाही त्याच्या छोट्या जमिनीच्या तुकड्यावर ती पिकं घ्यायला पुढे येऊ लागली उस्मानाबादच्या कृषी विज्ञान केंद्रातल्या वैज्ञानिकांना आम्ही वेळोवेळी बोलायचं कमी पाणी वापरून शेतातून चांगलं पीक कसं मिळवायचं त्याच्या पद्धती कशा आहेत त्यांनी सांगितल्या त्यांच्या सल्ल्यानं आम्ही शेतकरी ज्यांच्या जमिनीच्या तुकड्यात ठिबक सिंचन पाणी सिपडणारे फवारे वगैरे वापरून शेती करू लागलो आमच्या शेतकरी महिलांना आता दुष्काळाची भीती वाटेनाशी झाली प्रयोगशाळेतून आमचं मॉडेल प्रत्यक्ष जमिनीवर आल्यावर किती यशस्वी झालं हे सर्वांच्या डोळ्यासमोर दिसायला लागलं अशा प्रकारे अनेक वर्ष काम केल्यानंतर स्थानिक हवामानाचे पॅटर्न आणि महिलांवर होणारे सामाजिक दबाव याचा विचार करून आम्ही वन एकर मॉडेल बनवलं त्यामध्ये छत्तीस प्रकारची कोरडभव आणि अल्प काळात तयार होणारी पिकं अर्धा ते एक एकर जमिनीवर घेतली जायची पालेभाज्या ज्वारी बाजरी कडधान्ये आणि ऋतूनुसार आम्ही वेगवेगळी बियाणे वापरायचं आमचं उद्दिष्ट एकच होतं की सर्वांना वर्षभरात चांगलं सकस आणि पौष्टिक खायला मिळायला पाहिजे पण सगळ्या महिलांना हे करणं सोपं नव्हतं गावातले उच्च जातीचे जे मुख्य पुरुष आहेत फारशी मदत न करणारे सरकारी न अधिकारी आणि घरात मारझोड करणारे नवरे या सर्वांना तोंड द्यायचं लागत होते वन एकर मॉडेलची जी खरी परीक्षा होती ती दोन हजार बाराच्या दुष्काळात झाली मराठवाड्यात चाळीस वर्षात झाला नव्हता असा दुष्काळ यावर्षी परत पडला शेतीसाठी सोडाच प्यायलाही पाण्याचा थेंब नव्हता शासनाने पाठवलेले टँकर आणि खाजगी पाणी विकणारे यांच्यावर आमची मिस्त होती येणारा प्रत्येक दिवस आमच्यासाठी एक आव्हान होता या दुष्काळात नगदी पिकं घेणारा शेतकऱ्यांचे खूप नुकसान झालं शेतात उभा असलेला ऊस सुकून गेला कर्जबाजारी झाल्यामुळं अनेक शेतकऱ्यांना आत्महत्या कराव्या लागल्या पण त्याच काळात आमच्या महिला शेतकरी तगून राहिल्या मला 
मला खूप आनंद याचा झाला की आमच्या अनेक शेतकरी महिला आता स्थानिक पातळीवर लिडर बनून लागल्या त्यांनी इतर शेतकऱ्यांना आमचे वन एकर मॉडेल स्वीकारून शेती करायला प्रवृत्त केलं पुरुषांनाही अन्नधान्य पिकवायचं महत्त्व पटवून दिलं ते आम्हाला पाठिंबा देऊ लागले आम्ही या महिलांना सरकारी योजना आणि सबसिडीवर याचा लाभ मिळवून दिला आणि स्थानिक बाजारात विक्री करण्यासाठी मदत केली त्यामुळं महिलांची मिळगत आणि बचत खूप वाढायला लागली दोन हजार सातमध्ये सात शेतकऱ्यांनी सुरू केलेलं हे मॉडेल साठ हजार महिला शेतकऱ्यांनी स्वीकारलं आणि त्यानुसार त्या शेती करत आहेत स्थानिक पातळीवर मिळालेलं हे यश या क्षेत्रातल्या संस्था आणि जगभरात काम करणाऱ्या कार्यकर्ते यांना सांगण्याची मला संधी मिळाली इतर देशामध्ये लोक क्लायमेट चेंज म्हणजे हवामान बदलातला सामना कसा करत आहेत हे त्यांच्याकडून शिकायला मिळालं गेल्या दहा वर्षात मी सतरा देशात फिरले मी विमानातून प्रवास करताना खाली पाहतच राहायचे गंधोरा गावातल्या महिला शेतकऱ्यांनी कष्टाने आणि हिमतीने पिकवलेली हिरवीवाच शेत दिसतीये का म्हणून बघतच राहायचे आम्ही शेतकरी महिला या प्रवासामध्ये खूप पुढं आला आहोत पण अजून बरीच लढाई बाकी आहे वन एकर मॉडेल गावागावामध्ये पोचायला हवं प्रत्येक घरातल्या बायकांना उत्पादक आणि जमिनीचा मालक म्हणून ओळख व्हायला हवी एकत्रित काम केलं तर हे नक्की शक्य होईल माझे नाव गोदावरी आहे आणि मी नदीसारखी वाहतच राहणार आहे Yeah, thank you so much, Hritika and uh, Maitri. I think it's a really wonderful and a moving story. And I think it's really great that you got uh, Godavri to be the speaker of this film. I think it's really an honor to have her be part of this project in this way. So thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next comic, um, Let the River Flow Free from the Philippines. And I'll just keep the introductions really short. And Nina Martinez is an illustrator from Manila. And uh, yeah, she graduated from the University of the Philippines with a BFA in visual communication and Faye Kura is a writer, editor, researcher, and founder, as well as publisher of Gantala Press. We heard about it before, a feminist small press based in Metro Manila, the Philippines. Yeah, and please tell us about your story now. Um, hello, uh, good, good afternoon. So our comics is about the struggle of the indigenous uh, women and men of uh, Kalinga province in Northern Philippines in the 1970s when they fought against the building of the Chico River Dam. Um, it, it's a, a dam funded by the World Bank and um, instigated by the then by the, the dictator president, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. So uh, the community fought, uh, they engaged in a lot of protest actions, they talk to um, public officials. They also sought the support of the international community as well as the support of Filipinos outside of Northern Philippines. So they were able to prevent the, the building of the dam and that's a, such a victory for, um, for any indigenous group, I would think, and for the Filipino people as well. So uh, this afternoon, we're going to show a, um, a short Uh, documentary um, featuring three of the characters in the comics, uh, and and then we'll uh, I'll be talking about the political situation in the Philippines just to share a bit of a context to the story, and then Nina will um, talk about the creation of the comics. So we can now um, play the film. Kalinga women are not strangers to resistance and repression. In modern history, the defense of their land 
resources, and culture has always been paramount. Resource-rich Cordillera region where Kalinga is located has always been a target for exploration and exploitation by foreign investments. Previous regimes have used laws and military might to ensure the implementation of huge and destructive projects. The people, women in particular, have withstood past regimes' attacks on their communities to bow down to big capitalist aggression, such as the Chico Dam in the 70s. Hindi na nga rami dati tent. Ang fami inikat. Nga babae. Hindi kampu. Babae laing ah. Uray no ang niya ti magbagan ti NPC. Hami nga dingding. Gin ka ti kaunan ti umili. Ito nga ili, ili mi. So nga ipatay mi adeta. Today, the Chevron Geothermal Project has partnered with Aragorn Power and Energy Corporation, the power unit of C-led APC Group Incorporated, to tap into Kalinga's geothermal resources. This intrusion into their ancestral domain has threatened the people of Kalinga, most especially the women and children, with the onslaught of militarization where communities and their schools are turned into camps in the haste to implement such projects. Sinuti pandag iti militari banbantayan iyay lugar. Da kami mit lang nga mang madi karag iyay yung mga dadakkal nga kumpanye. Iso nga manipod ang kamkampo dag iti militar iyay ayan mi Ijay min nga nasurong, no kas ano nga lumaban mit lang kanyada. Tidaga, danum, ken kabakiran. Ijay min nga nasurusuro, no kas ano nga lumaban. Protektaran na giyay nga nagapuan mi. Ta isukit garod tip mabiyagyan mi eh. As if these energy projects were not enough, the Duterte government has entered into a lopsided agreement with China through the Chico River Irrigation Pump Project that is clearly a debt trap for the country and a project that shall deprive the upland communities of much-needed water. Despite harassments and intimidation, the women maintain their vigilance and strengthen their organizations through sustained discussions and mobilization. <laughs> Siyempre, nakita namin yung mga sundalo, nakakampo sa mga bahay, ganyan. Uh, gumawa ang community ng mga petition. Sinamahan pa rin natin yung mga member ng uh, PO natin sa community na uh, pinareceive sa batalyon uh, sa headquarters ng 50th ID. ID. Karit kinyata yung amang Ituloy nga mang laban ka dagito nga proyekto. Inspirasyon tayo ti kapadasan dagiti imununa nga kababaihan tapno protektaran wenno ilaban irupier DJ Kalinte Ganda iti nagtaudan adaga. Daga! Thank you. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we wrote the comics in 2020 during the administration of uh, President Rodrigo Duterte, um, who you may know <laughs> as a uh, misogynistic despot, um, who orchestrated the killing of um, tens of thousands of poor Filipinos under the guise of uh, the so-called drug war. Um, 
he is also uh, responsible for several uh, hundreds of politically motivated extrajudicial killings. So as of 2022, uh, for more than 400 farmers, including indigenous uh, people and activists, um, have been killed under Duterte. Um, this include the nine indigenous leaders from the Tumandok tribe who were massacred by the military in 2020. Uh, they were opposing military presence and human rights violations in their area. And um, they were also against land grabbing and the building of a mega dam in their province. No? So, um, of course, the dam would displace them. That's why they were opposing it. Hundreds are also victims of um, red tagging and um, illegal arrest. Um, the video features three of the characters um, in our comics, no? so Mother Leticia Bulaat, Betty Belen, and Rogin Beyao. So um, the comics opens with the arrest and imprisonment of Betty Belen, who has been leading uh, the protest actions against Chevron, as you, you've seen in the film. And um, Betty's case illustrates what uh, activists in the Philippines experience now. No? So they are being red tagged or accused as um, communists and therefore terrorists, no? And then um, soldiers plant guns or weapons in their homes, and then uh, they, are, uh, they are arrested uh, on the false charges of possessing dangerous weapons. And then usually uh, the military would go to the houses of the activists at dawn or at mid-morning, no? While the community is still asleep. And uh, this is reflected in the comics. Uh, even in the 1970s, the military has been practicing this. Uh, attacking at dawn. No? Um, the, the 1980s um, saw the cancellation of the Chico River Dam and the downfall of the uh, dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. And of course, both of these are uh, the result of people coming together to protest. Um, however, the struggle of the indigenous peoples in the Philippines has continued and intensified, especially in uh, the recent administration. Um, of course, all through the succeeding governments, no, uh, they've been suffering. Uh, agriculture and ancestral lands face intensive militarization and development aggression because soldiers uh, usually work on behalf of multinational corporations that want the ancestral lands or the agricultural lands to um, build their mining companies and their uh, big plantations. No? So now it gets worse because uh, despite uh, in next piece, uh, despite the um, heavy uh, what you call this, uh, despite evidence of um, vote rigging, vote buying, and massive disinformation, um, the the former dictator's son, no, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is uh, set to become the next president of the Philippines, and uh, the daughter of Duterte is the preemptive uh, winner of the vice presidential polls. No? So um, Filipinos worry that this tandem will ensure that the old men, no, Marcos Sr. and Duterte Sr., will now never be held accountable for the crimes that they committed against the Filipino people. So we're talking about billions of dollars of stolen wealth, and plunder of natural resources, um, and of course the human rights violations uh, that continue to this day. So uh, Marcos Jr. has declared plans to continue Duterte's Build, Build, Build program, which has further embroiled the country in foreign debt uh, to, the, to the U.S., to Europe, uh, European countries, and now to China. Um, he will likely push for the implementation of the Kaliwa Dam, the Gened Dam, the Chico River projects, um, and other destructive infrastructure programs opposed by the people. And uh, Sara Duterte, no, the next vice president, will reportedly head the education department, uh, which can, we, this is very disturbing because um, this can easily lead to a horrible state of um, historical revisionism and uh, miseducation among uh, Filipino students and youth. Uh, just to share, no, in the beginning, uh, I, I wrote this with my partner, uh, 
well, we were thinking of a, um, we were trying to find a character who could organically uh, narrate the story of Mother Tining et al. And then uh, we couldn't find any character. But then we realized that uh, why don't we feature a, um, a young woman activist no? who would uh, anyway represent what has always been an important part of the Filipino people's struggle. Because uh, young women, women also, no, they're young, young women, old women, they're, they're always there in the, in the struggle. Uh, but uh, history, in our history, in our history books, it's only the men, the male heroes who are being featured and are being taught, if they're taught at all. <laughs> um, so the character Shera in the comics was based on Rajin, no, the one who spoke earlier in the film. Uh, she's the secretary general of the indigenous women's group that we consulted for the comics. Um, this just goes to show that it is the young Filipinos who continue the tasks of agitating, organizing, and mobilizing for revolutionary change. Um, so, uh, as you can see in the picture, no, you can one can feel the strong presence of young Filipinos in the current uh, protests against the electoral results. So we are proud to have contributed to this um, important important task of agitating, organizing, mobilizing, um, and documenting history as well through these comics. And uh, we're happy that it's in several languages. So if ever we get red tagged or um, uh, we get banned in the Philippines, for example, because the government is starting to, to do that now, they're starting to red tag small publishers. Um, at least the, the story exists in other languages um, elsewhere in the world. So one of the lessons, uh, we, we also would like to take this opportunity uh, to appeal to the international community to um, support the Filipino people's resistance against Marcos, Duterte, and imperialism, the constant uh, problem. Uh, because one of the lessons we can take away from the comics is that it was also the international community's support that um, amplified the Kalinga people's calls in the 1970s to the 1980s and helped clinch the victory for our grandparents. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Nina Martinez. I was the illustrator for our comic. I'm going to talk very briefly about the creation of it. Right. Um, these were some of the first few sketches I did when Faye approached me with the idea of illustrating Mother Leticia's story. Um, there, are many, uh, there are many written accounts about what happened then, but very few photographic references. There were barely any photos of Mother Leticia in her youth, just in present day. So there was a bit of guesswork on my part. There were many characters involved for whom there were no photos at all, or they were already mythologized through other people's illustrations. So one of my um, problems to tackle was um, how much of this can I um, create on my design on my own? Uh, what can I guess from the photos we have now or from the few photos and videos that could be sent to us over the internet because it was the pandemic and we could not travel there ourselves? It asks, um, is illustration already a form of fictionalizing at this point? Um, I'm really lucky that I had a great writer in Faye and our partner Tere and a great source of inspiration in Mother Leticia that I could do what I could as one artist in a large collaboration. And even then I was prone to mistakes. I remember one of the first few pieces of feedback Mother Leticia gave me was that I drew her eyes too small. So um, it was great to have that at least. Um, I used brush and ink throughout the project. Um, even if it was later digitally printed or digitally distributed, I felt it was important to use a medium that let me fe feel connected to the story. Ink is liquid and random, like the river that is depicted in the story. And I wanted to feel that connection even if that does not necessarily come across to the person reading that I used that, I felt that it improved my work. Um, I warmed up by drawing pieces of the story, isolated to see what I felt was important to capture. 
Um, again, I tried to use the photos available to us, the video that you saw, I used references from there, and the photos sent to us from um, our contacts, which actually was another great way to edit the story because they themselves, the subjects of the story, prioritized what should I capture, what should I show in the comic, and they showed me what they valued. So I feel that they were able to give a lot of their own voice in the story, even though we were the ones translating it into comics. Um, this is, I started out with thumbnails, and then I drew it digitally with a tablet, and then I printed it, and then I went over it with my brush and ink and a light box, it's really amusing to show this to a non-artist because they ask, um, why did you bother to do it uh, with traditional mediums when you already had it digitally? And, my, and um, my joke is usually, I bought brush pens and I'm going to use them. But the truth is, I f did genuinely feel more connected to this story with this, um, with ink, with the, how it values randomness and the naturalness of the story. So I'm very happy to show this to you today and to show it in different languages. And I'm really glad that we are telling this to you now in a time when um, repression, media repression is in, in closing upon us. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy our comic. Yeah. Hey, Nina, thank you so much for sharing this powerful story and reminding all of us that we're all responsible to take action. Thank you. Now we're moving on to the next story, which comes from Mexico, and uh, which is called, in English, it's called Morning Fog, and its creators are Alejandra Aretena Betancur, who is a Mexican writer who lives in Milpa Alta, Mexico City, and uh, Pepe Aretana Betancur, who is a Mexican visual artist who lives also in Milpa Alta, Mexico City. It's working? Yeah, it is. Uh, hi. Well, thank you for being here. And well, we are like very happy to, to be in, in this festival, sharing our experience doing this comic and participating in this, I think, very important conversations about feminisms and art. And also because, well, we have the opportunity to tell you some, well, some part of the story of our pueblo. Pueblo is a word in Spanish that means, it means um, like a small town, but it also means people. So I, I'm going to use that word because it's, um, it's a complex concept that refers uh, both the, the territory and the people. So uh, first we want to show you an animation that uh, Pepe prepared for you. It is based completely on our comic. You will see it's basically the panels animated. Um, it's, it's simple, but I think it's cute and will help you to understand some aspects of our story. And also, ah, I have to tell you something, you're going to, to hear our mother tongue, which is Nahuatl. Nahuatl is an indigenous language uh, that is spoken in, in Mexico. Mm, the, the variant that is spoken in Ilpalta is almost lost. And thanks to, to Temashtiani Alberto Castro, who is our translator, our Nahuatl translator, and his group of students, we, we could do this. So I'm, I'm very happy that you are going to have this opportunity to hear this, this, this language. So. I, I can do it myself.
Tienen casta ignorancia. Sani quinequilla. Tikilnamikis, ¿qué me ni toca o inin? Inin la naca siente cuacostli. Iwan inin. Ah, mutikilnamiki. Se sholet. Iwan inin. Se pizonacastli. Iwan inin xochit. Witzilin xochit. Iwan inin kosti xochit. Katson potoni. ¿Tleika in tocao inin? Nahuatlahtoltin. Yuzki no kin molguyaya tocolwan. Ajmo, ajmo, huele seco al mistli. Mayeti yagüe, ajmo shimo mauti. Nimitz la pa huilis se sanili. Qué huevo, cao, huele la huilsin. Y la yacancatsin, momoscatlaca. Ocmo monaguilti totlalnan. Ejua, oasi castilan tlaca. Huellitlahuilzin, homo miquili. Iguanajmo, o con moititi, que menotlan y tlaelehuilis. Yex se saniman. Cuajpetzintli, ogmo michihuili, iguan kaxtilantlakat, okiman, inintlali, ajmo towashka. Toko gualtzintzin, okin mopiyalijke, totlaltopampa, yeijka se huentli, se huejka huentli, yeze, mochipa tetzlakuilia ininguentli. Inintlali, nehuat, ayajmo, nitlacatica, ixcuac, inyaoyo o ácido al pepe. Zapata totecu, o gualmatlactoltico nahuatlactoli. Yehuat sino quimomoitlanini, tocolcitziguan, y pampa itlo. Moyauchiuzque. Inic oquitlahuiuzque intlalnan. Intocayotia. Tecuhtin. Yese. Tecpanoquitemicti. Iguanoquitlatequiti inic choloa. Tlacame. Omo gualcuepke. Nehuat, ni chichiquitzin, que mentejuat. Ixcuat, oti gualcuepke, malacastepec, momosco. Inic no tajuan, ino no mo gualcuepke, tlalocan. Senca quitlatemoa inaltepeu. Chiquita, no chitlein techmoneki in cuautlan techmaca. Ay, timo mautis, y pampa y mi tlali mocha, y guanme guan mochipa, y mi tzcuitla huili.
We, we live in Milpalta. Milpalta is very easy to, to locate in a map. You can find it very, very easily. It's in the southeastern corner of Mexico City. And it's one of the last native, mm, yeah, native pueblos, pueblos originarios, native, uh, native small towns that exist inside the capital of the country. And it's one of the last places where uh, Nahuatl is spoken natively. So um, you also, well, you have also seen that there is a myth uh, within the community about our relationship with, with our land, right? Um, it's a very, well, it, it, it says that we are the, the heirs of an ancestral land. And that has a lot of implications through the times because we have been there like over 500 years. And you have also seen that Zapata uh, was there and Zapata, I'm sure many of you have heard about him because he's very famous, not only in Mexico. He, he was one of the most important leaders of Mexican revolution especially because he asked, other, he asked other peasants to fight for the lands. He was in Milpalta and he's still a very important icon for our agrarian and indigenous movement. I mean, it's not only in our community, but in many other indigenous and agrarian communities in Mexico. And well, he's still remembered, but I, I think that there are also other figures that are important to know, specifically in each community, right? And in our case, it was Doña Arminia. Ah, well, we are going, there she is. This is one of the few photos we have of her. Um, and well, let me, um, give me a moment. Uh, Ah, well, uh, yeah, like I told you, we have been there like over 500 years, so during this time there have been several attempts to take, to take our land. Different governments and different uh, private agents have tried to do it both in both colonial and modern times. So one of the most recent uh, events was the comunero, comunero movement. Comunero is a word that we use to refer to a person that is part of a community, a person that has, has born in Milpalta and has rights over the land because they are communal, they are not, uh, the form of ownership is not public nor private. It's a very specific kind of, of ownership. We can translate it maybe like communal, right? So the comunero, a comunero is a person that is part of a community and has rights over the, the communal lands. And in the, seven, in the 17th and 80s, um, a lumber company uh, was illegally logging uh, the, the forests of Milpalta because most of these communal lands are forests and volcanoes that provide uh, natural services to Mexico City and other parts of the, of the country. So they organized to, to fight against this, uh, this lumber company because uh, they discovered that the, um, the local government was also implicated in, in this situation because of corruption. And they also find, found out that the, um, the communal representative was also implicated so they organized to fight, to, fight, to fight this situation. And there were a lot of men and, and women, young people, elder people. I mean, almost all the pueblo was fighting. It, it, you can see the photo, some photos and you will see a lot of people. And Pepe told me it was very difficult to, to draw that, uh, that quantity of people in each panel. <laughs> but, uh, most what well, well we have to admit that most of the leaders were men because um, many indigenous communities in Mexico are very traditional to say it 
in some soft way, right? They are very traditional and wom women don't usually participate in public um, in, in public um, spaces. Mm -hmm. But uh, Doña Herminia was one of the was one of the few women that were having a very important role, and she was the only one that was elected a uh, representative of her pueblo. I have to make here a, a note. Uh, Milpalta is composed by nine pueblos, and each one has a, rep a communal representative. And then we have another representative, like a general representative. Well, the Yerminia was elected a uh, communal representative of San Lorenzo Tlacoyucan. She was elected by her people. And she was like a very, um, she was very, very popular among San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Tlacoyucan's people. And well, I have to say something about the process. And I think it was very similar to, to the process of, of the other teams. Because of the pandemic, it was very difficult to, to go to the agrarian ar archive to look for photos or to look for documents that help us to, to tell this story. So we have to do a lot of local research. And I think that was wonderful because we, that way we can make the community participate in, in, this, in this comic. And we also have to recognize that other people have done very similar work that the one we wanted to do. And we, we went, well, we interviewed some, some local chroniclers that have recorded some, of, some parts of this story. People that had photos, they have say self-worded during many years, during almost 40 years. They had these photos and they were like their own and personal archives, right? And they shared with us those photos, those notes of newspapers, so we can reveal this story. Um, because we have also to, say, to tell you that Don Herminia and her son passed away almost uh, 15 years ago, so we don't we didn't have the opportunity to interview her or to interview uh, her descendants because they are, they are not uh, alive anymore. But we fortunately met people who, who met her. And I think it was also very important to make some questions about uh, creating arts in indigenous communities, right? Like, how can we tell this story without, um, without well, avoiding uh, racist um, preconceptions about indigenous people? Um, Pepe, Pepe, do you want to explain this? Maybe in Spanish and I can translate it. Uh, okay. I think it's very important when you are doing some project to find the soul of the story so you can define the style and therefore keep identity or find the identity of the project. So uh, we collect some photograph and image that our neighbors uh, borrow were us, so I did some studios faces because for me it's truly important to pay attention to how we portray brown or indigenous people because there is a problem in Mexican media. There is a lot of bad stereotypes or they are underrepresented. Uh, also, the forest and the territory are characterized by themselves, so it was important to how uh, 
to be familiarized by oh, with the context. So we visited the forest twice, and there are a few sketches of the forest that I did, and it helped me to find a style. And well, I have a very sin uh, estilo sintético. Well, she synthesized the, I mean, the forest is a very complicated space, right? Because there are a lot of elements there. Just a tree has hundreds, thousands of leaves. So Pepe tried to synthesize that, those elements and find like a very simple style because we had, we had to draw a lot of trees, trees in, in the comic, right? And I think that, well, the, the one that is um, the low at the bottom, it's not part of the comic, it's part of our uh, report, our investigation report, but it, it takes elements of uh, ancient codex. And even those uh, like footprints are an element that is very common in pre-Hispanic pre codex and colonial codex. And I think that was also part of, of Pepe's investigation about how to, to portray this story because even if we are using um, a Western style of art, like comic, uh, comics are, we wanted to add some elements of, of our own graphic tradition. And I think that that's why it was very important to, to, to meet Amruta Patil, who was our or mentor during this project because she uh, invite, uh, invited us to, to do this exercise to find our own graphic traditions. Be even if we are doing Western art, um, we can add these elements and it's going to, to transmit our identity to our work. Uh, well, um, well, these are more, um, images from very ancient uh, documents. And I think I have to tell you something that um, usually when we talk about indigenous imagi imaginary, we think it's only pre-Hispanic, right? But uh, all our traditions are always evolving. And many of these elements are not just pre-Hispanic. Some of them are innovations made in both colonial and modern times. Some of them are uh, new. Um, glyphs. 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 I don't know the word. Like, um, yeah. Well, those uh, icons, right? Those symbols. Some of them were created in modern times by people from our community to represent the the different pueblos. Each one has one of these icons, these symbols. So they are not. Even if they are taking some. Pre-Hispanic pre icons, they are being, you know, uh, they are being innovated. They are innovated. They have modern elements. So I think that's also a very important, um, um, yeah, discussion we have to uh, we have to have as indigenous artists or as a native artist, which, what are our own traditions? How our art is not um, frozen in the pre-Hispanic times or before the colonization that, that we have to, to, make, uh, to make other people understand that we have, or we have been doing art <laughs> during all these 500 years, right? It's not like we, we stay the same. We, we also transform our, our way to communicate our stories. And I'm, I'm very excited with this project, actually. We're planning to do workshops in, in our community so more people can, can know this, this story because we think memory is, is very important to, to keep a, a fight alive. You, you have to, to know uh, the, the importance of the place where you are. You have to know who you are so you can, f you can defend it from others. Um, I think the mo the, one of the most important things we have to do with this project is to create spaces for our community to discuss these issues, to, 
that children can listen to the elders and that are still alive and who who experienced some of these events so that the memory can can be can be shared shared, shared can be shared because i think you, you all know that but many of the of the problems we are talking about right in this moment are are still happening the the communal lands are still uh, at risk it's not that the communal movement even if they achieve they have their achievements we still have to to resist to the urbanization of mexico city to illegal land seizure and and many other stra strategies of the government and private agents to take this land so I don't know. I, I'm very happy, and I I really hope we can do something for our community with this material, that this story can be can be shared, and 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 that way Malakashtepec Momoshko, which is the Nahuatl name for Milpalta, can can be can be alive for many 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 other years. Thank you Thank so you. much, Alejandra and Pepe. Yeah, and thanks for educating us about the power of art and the involvement of indigenous arts, because I think this is a very important topic. So thank you all, and thank you for your wonderful presentations. And the, the I can't believe that you all managed to do um, animations, films. I'm really impressed. I, again, I've learned so much from this project. I'm really honored to be part of this and to be here with you and share these experiences. And I have a load of questions, but we're running out of time. So I think we're going to um, open up to the to the floor also. And we also have some questions. So if you're a bit shy or hesitating, if you don't know what to want to ask, you can also wait. And I'll just start with my first question that I also was inspired to ask you by Urvashi, because um, Urvashi said, um, what about the responsibility to tell these stories? Did you did you feel this responsibility, as Urvashi said, and I think you said also in your comics, if we're not going to tell it, nobody's going to tell it. Was that some kind of motivation that was always there in the background for you? Um. For sure, writing and one of the things is that we were also speaking about and we're constantly aware of that, you know, we also question whether we were the right people to be doing this comic. It was in constant negotiation, but I think one of the main criteria was to make the whole process, as feminist practice indicates, participatory and have Godavari Dange, who herself, you know, has not been written about so much in like the national press, has not got recognition, but is steering a huge, humongous movement, uh, which is very, very crucial. So, which is why I think the way in which we engaged with responsibility and accountability was, it was a negotiation on the field while we were creating the comic, while sharing the comic. And uh, to do that, we ensured that Godavari Dange herself was part of the entire process and continues to be in it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think that um, we found that this story has has already been told by oral chroniclers, by local oral chroniclers. Um, I think that uh, we feel responsibility as an artist because art can do different things. I mean, I, I, that was a question. Why are we telling this story if there are already some records of it. And it was because um, art and fiction, because we have to fictionalize some, some parts of the story, uh, can do some powerful things, some powerful and different things. And, and we, we, take that respons that resp we took that responsibility as, an, as artists. Like we are not telling like a historic, we are not doing a historic doc document. We're trying to appeal to, to the most human part of this story. And th that's something that sometimes is lost in, in other kind of documents. So I think that was our main, our main f responsibility to, to keep that part of the story alive, to transmit it. 
Um, it's it's not really our um, from the get go. It's we didn't really like um, claim this to be our story. Of course, this is the story of the uh, women of um, Northern Philippines. No, it's their story, and the ideal situation would really be to have them tell their own story. Uh, it just so happens that we uh, we had the resources uh, that were necessary so that. Um, we can tell the story in this particular way, you know, in the way of the comics, uh, written in in several languages, etc. So um, I think it's very it was very important that uh, it was clear to us from the very beginning that we were this is not ours at all. <laughs> um, this is their story, and uh, that's why we made we made sure to consult with them, like uh, Ritika and my team, you know. We made sure to consult with the indigenous women's group, not o not only individuals, but with the whole group, because uh, they're all working as a collective, and we were we were working as um, a collective as well. So um, we we made sure that we consulted with them um, every step of the way, and that uh, we had their approval uh, in all in all aspects of the story. Are there questions from the audience? Already, yeah, I see a hand. Can could we have the mic? It's in the third row. Yeah, in the middle of the third row. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your for sharing with us today. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that there was sometimes like coming together before the comic book writing process started over a couple of years. Um, if you were involved in that, I wanted to know um, what was the biggest thing that you um, that you gained from coming together and if there was anything you were able to bring back home with you to share in your community um, from that. I, I think I, um, I have to clarify at this point because that was another group. I just wanted to um, point out that there was a continuation of ideas and that the, the feeling of um, lacking archives, especially for um, feminist movements from the global south and indigenous feminist movements was felt and shared by different activists. But actually none of these, um, the, the participants from this group um, were part of the other group, but I know that some of them know each other. So there is like interconnections between feminists um, activist groups. Oh. <laughs> um. Okay, but if I'm very interested in the idea of feminist communities and how they come together and what you get from being able to share with others, if anyone has anything to say on that. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to answer that question, but, I'll <laughs> but I think that's something that was like very important to us that is that we realized that many indigenous communities around the world are facing very similar problems. And, and I think it's like very inspiring to see uh, other communities' strategies to resist those situations. And I also like very touched to see other artists to, other artists' struggles to, to portray those stories. I, I mean, it's not an easy discussion how to portray violence, how to portray uh, the human part of a very cruel situation. But I think that all the comics did a wonderful, wor a wonderful work showing the light, the light that people always uh, have, that people always have no matter what the situation is. And maybe that's one of the most, um, well, one of the most important learnings that I, I, I have of this experience, that we are not alone. No, we are not alone. We are facing very similar things, and the future is plural. And that's the only way we can survive the things that are happening. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? It's very warm. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. Right, it's not only um, something that you that that changed in the way you you work, but also in the way you live, in the, 
in a, in a way you you want to be a human being. And I think that that's a good knowledge to yeah that that's a good lesson to to share with the, with a with the community. I mean, we are part of it, so these are something we are discussing with other artists that are are in our community that are involving in in the promotion of this of this project in the community. I don't know if I answered it at all, but that's it. <laughs> Um, I want to add when we were all when we had all met only on Zoom when we were sharing our stories before the comics were made, a uh, common thing we all shared was that we noticed for many of our protagonists, feminist is not the first word they would use to describe themselves or their story, because one thing we are our stories are set in the global south, and it is so rarely just a women's issue, and they will not uh, they would not frame it as that. But then we still, with that in mind, we all agreed that what these people did helped the women in their community. So we had that to motivate us and to help us write and illustrate the story. So I was glad to hear that from other parts of the global south to know that there is this debate going on, but there is a way to discuss it with others. Thank you. I can just add one bit about how we came together. We had this mentorship in groups and we were constantly bouncing off idea, bouncing ideas off each other. So I remember in our first workshop, uh, we were trying to come up with a, a theme, a running theme in terms of the aesthetic and we were not able to, like we didn't have a specific style or a fixed color palette. And I remember it was Nina who came up with the idea, the suggestion that we can focus on this cracked earth motif. So that kind of became a running theme. So in that sense, it's a very tangible um, input that um, helped in the making of our comic at least. Yeah, thank you all for those lovely presentations. Also, what's so inspiring is that, um, you know, it's not just a piece of writing for you. It's actually the piece of writing is a reflection of your political commitment and involvement. I want to ask you a question. You know, yesterday there was a lot of um, reference to and discussion about the intergenerational differences in the feminist movement and the kind of differences perhaps between the older generation and younger generation. You're all young. Uh, and one of the accusations that's often made is that younger feminists have no sense of history, of their history. Um, and yet the movements you're talking about show the involvement, especially Nina and Faye when you were talking about younger pe people. So I wonder if you might like to comment on this or reflect on this. Is it that younger feminists have no sense of history or no hunger or curiosity about their history? Or is it that those histories are simply absent and unavailable or is it both? What, what would you say? Uh, <laughs> um, I think that um, uh, young feminists are uh, hungry for history, most uh, definitely. No, that's why I think uh, this this book is very successful. I think it's it's really successful and it it it's um, touching a lot of people. Um, they they find it to be brilliant. They want to join the next uh, collection if there's a next collection, etc. But it just so happens that uh, the powers that be, um, unfortunately, they still control how he, that history is being told. No? So uh, you know, uh, it's a history dominated by men. So even, in, even indigenous history is dominated by male heroes. Uh, in fact, if you mention the Chico River Dam um, struggle, you know, the first a name that comes to mind is Makliing Dulag, no, who, who was killed by the government uh, in the 19, in 1980 uh, for his uh, opposition to the project. So even I personally did not know uh, the extent of the women's involvement in the struggle, and that, that was really eye-opening for me. And um, it was eye-opening at the same time it um, 
it made me realize or it it reaffirmed it reaffirmed uh what i have been seeing all along um in my for example in my uh, work um uh like when i work with uh peasant women when i go to communities etc i see strong women leaders who are being supported by their husbands uh they farm they 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 rear they they rear their children they um they take care of their homes and yet they still uh have the time to defend their land from these land grabbers no because they're strong women they're strong leaders they're strong women so uh this you know, um i think uh even if um that history is being controlled by uh you know the the repressive government in the case of the philippines now who's been ha red tagging um publishers and uh labeling us as communists as terrorists because the the two are synonymous with each other in the philippines um despite that uh there is a hunger among young feminists to to overcome that and uh, find the the truth themselves and um hold on to that truth so it's a good thing that um like the feminist the women leaders i know the, the active women activists i know are also as uh, nina mentioned um they're also connected to the other issues um involving them their class involving their their sector no it's not just women's issues um among among young women activists i'm also uh careful to use the word feminist actually although i'm a feminist <laughs> but um yeah so uh yeah that's my answer oh, good. <laughs> uh, to add to that I, i think that sense of young feminists not having a sense of history is because many of them only started realizing it was okay to call themselves one because of the internet um for example i grew up i i, I saw the inequality i saw how i was asked to not speak back to my father or how i was expected to be married and have children um how women were supposed to behave or how or the onus is on them to not um have sex or be assaulted etc and then i realized later on when i was started using the internet as a, as a kid that there is a word for the kind of discussions being had and then the problem with the internet is that it with social media even is that it's not very good at showing these young feminists how intersectional it is that it ties back to class to race to um in um indigenous uh people to the environment and i think once it is the, there is better education about that um these young feminists realize will realize that um women are affected by everything not just by social pressures or that social pressures come from everywhere um this uh, that's why i appreciate that this book um makes uh, allowed us to bring in different issues because they are so um um irreversibly tied with what women experience Yeah, um thank you everybody. Unfortunately, our time is already up, but I think these were really um great um closing remarks and I also think that the book is um kind of a document of intergenerational feminist dialogue and there are so many intersections to be to be seen and to be learned from in this book uh, that I think it's a real treasure and I hope you all buy this book at the book stand over there and um I think we'll be around if you have any more questions I'm sure uh, everybody is happy to answer them and engage in discussions and maybe you'll also be able to procure a book signing for yourself so thank you very much for coming and for listening thank you